The U.S. reached another unfortunate coronavirus milestone on Sunday, 5 million confirmed infections, more than any other country in the world. Of course, the pandemic is also taking a huge economic toll. President Trump signed executive orders Saturday aimed at helping Americans who are struggling financially because of the pandemic. The executive orders would bypass Congress after negotiations collapsed last week. But it's not clear how much the orders will ultimately help or if they're even legal. CBS News correspondent Michael George reports. Coronavirus President Trump signed the executive actions at his New Jersey golf club after talks hit a wall on Capitol Hill. We've had it, and we're going to save American jobs and provide relief to the American workers. The president's move Saturday aims to defer evictions, freeze payroll taxes for workers making about $100,000 or less, and extend 0% interest on student loans. On the most contentious issue, the president gives unemployed workers an extra $400 in weekly benefits, with states footing a quarter of the bill. Democrats want to extend the $600 weekly supplement that recently expired. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi and Senate Minority Leader Chuck Schumer released a statement tearing into the measures, saying in part, instead of passing a bill, now President Trump is cutting families' unemployment benefits and pushing states further into budget crises, forcing them to make devastating cuts to life or death services. Whether President Trump has the legal standing to act on his own remains unclear. If we get sued, it's somebody that doesn't want people to get money. Okay, and that's not going to be a very popular thing. On Friday, the government reported the jobless rate eased to 10.2 percent as employers added close to 2 million jobs last month. But economists say there's still a long and uncertain road ahead. Michael George, CBS News. And for the very latest, we are joined by CBS News White House correspondent Paula Reed. Paula is traveling with the president and joins us now from Bridgewater, New Jersey. Paula, we heard the president say there anybody who's going to challenge it is trying to take money away from people. In the lead up to this, there was a lot of discussion about the legality of the president bypassing Congress when it comes to financial matters. So how likely are we to see legal challenges to these executive orders? And if so, from whom? It's very likely that you're going to see legal challenges. Even the president himself admitted that. But in terms of who is going to file and what kind of challenges we'll see, let, let's go down the list of the executive action that the president signed. First of all, when it comes to the unemployment insurance, uh, there the president is extending these benefits uh, for several weeks. He's borrowing money from FEMA uh, to put towards this relief. He's also asking the states to kick in about 25 percent of that. That right there, that's right for some litigation. Uh, not only uh, is the Constitution pretty clear that the tax and spend power belongs uh, to Congress, uh, the president also doesn't necessarily have the power to co-opt states into contributing to what is actually a federal unemployment benefit that he is trying to convey. The next thing is the payroll tax cut. Uh, the president is deferring payroll taxes uh, for several months for folks. He suggested that he would make it permanent so you don't have to pay it back uh, next year uh, if he is reelected, sort of dangling that carrot. But let's be clear, the president cannot unilaterally issue a tax cut. Only Congress could forgive these taxes. So for anyone who qualifies for this deferment, uh, you will still be on the hook for that about 6.25 percent of your salary that you don't have to pay uh, between September and December. You'll be on the hook for it uh, next year unless Congress passes a law. Now, some employers, potentially even some taxpayers, could potentially uh, try to sue over this. Um, but then there's other actions that he took on student loans, uh, on evictions, uh, having to do with housing. Those two, I think, are less likely to face legal challenges successfully. There could certainly be some folks who try to sue over those. But there the president is issuing directions to administrative agencies, uh, so to the Department of Education, uh, to Housing and Urban Development. That's probably, legally speaking, more within his wheelhouse. But again, I pressed the president on this yesterday. I said, uh, are you giving people false hope? It's likely that potentially all of this relief could be almost immediately blocked by the courts, uh, either blocked indefinitely or at least delayed. Uh, so really, the tens of millions of Americans who are currently in limbo may not actually see anything tangible out of all the paper that the president signed yesterday. Yeah, we heard the president's response to you on that. I'm wondering if anybody else in the White House has outlined a legal defense uh, when you've been asking them, Paula. 
No, uh, there, there really hasn't been anyone who's been able to, to really drill down on these specific executive actions. Uh, for the past week or so, they've been floating all kinds of different ideas, but now that we actually see the, the fine print, uh, there has not really been a robust uh, defense, legally speaking, something that could really craft these uh, a constitutional argument for how all of this falls uh, within the president's power. Uh, this White House, though, they, they, have, they have been pretty aggressive about exploring the outer edges uh, of the president's executive authority. They have at times been successful. For example, with the travel ban, but it took them revising their travel ban multiple times uh, before that passed muster. So that may be what happens here. Uh, the president tests this, it gets blocked by the courts, they incorporate that feedback and eventually do something. Uh, but when we're talking about uh, evictions, when we're talking about unemployment relief for people who have been out of work for months, most of these people don't necessarily have months uh, or perhaps even years to wait for an answer from the Supreme Court. Yeah, obviously, there are real people who are counting on the government to work for them. These unemployment benefits in particular, as you say, Paula, are just crucial. So what happens if there is a successful legal challenge? Again, this relief will be delayed, certainly, um, but potentially blocked indefinitely. It could be that really everything yesterday uh, was just symbolic and none of this money actually exchanges hands. I would expect, though, that the student loan provision, uh, because it really mirrors what's already happened, uh, student loan borrowers, folks who have federal loans, and in some cases, uh, certain private loans as well, they don't necessarily have, they don't have to pay if they, if they don't want to or if they can't uh, over the next several months. That's been in place for several months. I would expect uh, that will likely continue for a period of time because, again, it mirrors what Democrats have wanted, just not uh, for as long. It's what the federal government is already doing. It's likely that will survive, but I, I wouldn't encourage, in my former life as a lawyer, I wouldn't encourage any clients uh, to depend, certainly not on the payroll tax cut, because they're going to have to pay that back, likely, or this unemployment insurance. They may never see it. And again, the relief for homeowners on mortgages and evictions, that's very complicated and nuanced and very situation specific. At this point, it it's really just not giving any clarity to all of the people out there who have questions about how to manage their lives in the wake of this unprecedented situation. Well, given this ambiguity and the desire by the American people to get firm answers on this, how likely do you think it is that Congress will be able to agree on a relief bill with the White House anytime in the coming weeks? And how could that affect these executive orders? It's a good question. Uh, based on what's happened over the last two weeks, uh, it doesn't appear that they can agree uh, on the big issues, particularly unemployment insurance. They haven't really given us any reason to be optimistic that they're all going to get together and figure it out. Uh, early Sunday morning uh, on the, the political talk shows, uh, Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin, who's been leading uh, these, these talks along with House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, they both left the door open to additional negotiations, but both of them suggested that the other side needs to bring something to the table uh, to consider. At this point, uh, it just does not appear that they're going to be able to come to an agreement. Uh, Republicans have floated the idea of a short-term agreement. Hey, let's, let's come to an agreement on a few issues and then come back later. But the House Speaker has flatly rejected that. She's worried that if they do that, Republicans are never going to come back to the table to deal with all those other issues. So right now, uh, look, it appears to be a stalemate. I don't see any reason for optimism about a deal, certainly not this week. Well, Paula, you were right there in the room for the president's announcement. I want to play for our viewers the president's claim about the Veterans Choice Program and then your follow-up question. Our vets are very special. We passed Choice, as you know, Veterans Choice and Veterans Accountability. And they've been trying to get that passed for decades and decades and decades, and no president's ever been able to do it. And we got it done, so veterans have choice. And Why I'm do you keep saying finished. that Go you ahead, passed please. Veterans Choice? Please. Veterans Choice. It was passed in 2014. Okay, excuse me. Go ahead, please. But it was a false statement, sir. Okay. Thank, sir, thank you very much, everybody. Thank you very much. All right, Paula. First of all, give us the facts about the Veterans Choice program and who passed it, and then tell us how how you expected the president to respond to that, and were you surprised that the president decided just to leave the room and not answer your question. 
When it comes to Veterans Choice, that's a law that was passed in 2014. Uh, president Obama signed it. The president has made this claim, though, dozens and dozens of times that he got it passed, that he was the one who did this when so many other presidents uh, could not. And this is the first time we believe he's ever been fact-checked uh, on that false claim. Now, he has subsequently signed uh, extensions or amplifications of that law, but he is not, uh, as, as he claims, the one who signed it. Now, in terms of his reaction, uh, this is uh, this is one of the first times, as I noted, he's, he's been called out on that particular uh, lie. He does not care uh, to, to be called out on false statements. Sometimes when it comes to those really intense confrontational moments, uh, his strategy is to move on to the next reporter. And uh, within the press pool, you have a choice. You can just sort of yield to your colleague. I've certainly done that time, uh, at times. But here I felt like he had moved on uh, because he didn't necessarily want to engage on this issue. And uh, it does not surprise me that he, he got frustrated. Look, it's a heated situation. There's a lot of us in there. Uh, it's crowded. As you could hear, uh, there were folks uh, uh, cheering him on uh, in the background. So there's a little bit of theater, but we've seen this before. And look, Lana, there have been times uh, when I've had a question and I saw he was trying to deprive one of my colleagues of a follow-up and I yielded. And sometimes I've lost my question too because he stormed out. He does not particularly care for it um, when we, we either work together or in this case, uh, I refuse, refuse to yield. And I think intelligent minds can disagree uh, whether I was being polite, but I was pressing him on a really important issue uh, that he has lied about dozens and dozens of times. And as you know, we did not get a response or an explanation for him about why he continues to make this false claim. Right, and some things are simply facts when it comes to who, in fact, passed the Veterans Choice Act. That's something that is written in the history books. Um, Paula, can you tell us anything more um, about those people who were jeering in the background, almost drowning you out when you asked that question? Yeah. It's interesting. It's a totally different environment. Uh, this is a press availability that the president held at his New Jersey golf club. Uh, that's where he's staying here. He invited us up there. It's the first time I've been there, but the press was invited uh, the night before for him to give a statement. And it's interesting because in some ways it sort of mirrors uh, a mini campaign rally because there the president has a group of supporters. These are folks who pay to belong to his golf club. Uh, many of them are wearing MAGA hats, uh, wearing his, his campaign swag, and they cheer him when he comes out. Uh, they laugh at his jokes. They boo us uh, when he criticizes the press. Very similar to what you get at a campaign rally, not what uh, you usually get at, at a press conference. The president really appeared to enjoy uh, this environment. But it's important to note uh, when I'm there pressing him on details uh, that are really critical to a lot of people's lives. As I said, tens of millions of Americans are currently in limbo, living paycheck to paycheck, concerned about how they're going to pay their student loans, concerned they could be evicted. When you're talking about issues uh, that have to deal with this group and you have in the back a group of people who pay hundreds of thousands of dollars to belong to a golf club owned by the president, sort of weighing in, jeering, booing, cheering. It's a very unusual uh, environment, but I think it's important to note that based on my observations and given that population, it is unlikely that any of the people in the back of that room are waiting on an unemployment check. All right, Paula Reed, traveling with the president in Bridgewater, New Jersey, and getting us facts and answers. Thank you.